Welcome to theCUBE's coverage of ISC High Performance 2023, where we're covering all things HPC, machine learning, AI, high performance analytics and quantum computing. And one of the most important topics in the HPC community is sustainability. And in this segment, we're going to try to more deeply understand how organizations can achieve sustainability through green energy and renewable sources. And so with me to do that are Matt Foley from AMD, Jerban Zernavan from Dell Technologies, and Guy Dowers at, from At North. Gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Shabon, big, big picture. If you think about all infrastructure power, um, how much of that actually is consumed by, by data centers? And then, and then how much of that is, is HPC? Well, first of all, Dave, let, let's put it into a context. You know, if you're looking about how much is the overall consumption um, of data centers, you will see that from the entire worldwide figure, you'll get into one, 1.5%, um, which you might say, well, doesn't look like big, but in reality is, is enormous, is very, very large. So based on several um, assessments done by, um, by Hyperion Research, you will see that, for instance, the on-prem um, HPC represents approximately a fifth, a fourth of the overall server implementation, especially here into, into EMEA. So this you can get into what? Because the, 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 uh, the consumption or the servers into an HP system, usually the compute, the nodes are very, very uh, hungry in terms of power consumption. You might say that we are getting into probably 0 0.5, 0.7 percentage of, uh, of, uh, of consumption. This is not at all easy to, to maintain. It, it, it's really important to understand um, how to build it and, and how to drive it because it represents an immense amount of power, which in these days comes with also a very large cost. If you think about the past, we used to say half of the price was for the acquisition of the hardware part, and the other part of the uh, other half of the cost of running an HPC represents the power. I think these days it started to be slightly different. Is the mix shifting? I mean, it sounds like it is. It sounds like the HPC and of course all this AI, you know, talk over the last you know couple of months is consume is it consuming? Is HPC now consuming a larger and larger portion of that pie, or is it more sort of steady state? I wonder, Sherban, maybe G, you have some thoughts on this. <laughs> Well, we are, we are in an IT world. So the usual answer to start with is it depends. Yeah. It depends what you understand by HPC, you know, and, you know, what activity which support discovery, creative process, generative AI, everything right now, you know, it, it really depends on um, how you understand that HPC is used outside of the data center. And then, you know, for instance, you have, products like FPGA, which are used in cameras, or, or Edge, um, more and more getting into, um, uh, into production. So HPC usage is growing. So as well as this is what's happening as well with the, with the power consumption associated. Yeah, so I, sh I should have shared with the audience. So Sherban works with a lot of Dell customers, uh, making sure that they're, they're getting the most out of their, their infrastructure. Now, Matt, um, you're with AMD, so you guys are down deep into the semiconductor land. What, what, talk about your role and your area of expertise. Well, certainly, yes. I manage the field application engineers for AMD across Europe, Middle East, and Africa for the commercial business. And HPC and adaptive computing is really what we are about at, uh, at AMD. And it's one of those things that we as a company have focused on uh, because it, it provides a lot of market insight. And so the, the advances that we make in order to compete successfully in the HPC market we can then take those and use those across the piece, as, as Shirban was mentioning before, about how HPC is infiltrating all sorts of other different areas outside of the uh, outside of the data center. And then beyond that, what we see as well is that, aside from just the usual efficiency moves where you you know take take a better process or use better packaging technology, what we really see here is a need for heterogeneous computing, where we're actually going to start taking the problems and decomposing them into different ways that acceleration can, can better solve them. 
And by doing that, we, we believe we can achieve step function improvements in terms of efficiency and sustainability instead of mere percentages. And we really look forward to working with all of our partners to, to package that up and provide that to the market. Yeah, that's exciting. I mean, orders of magnitude improvement would be huge. Uh, Guy, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about At North and, and your role. Your background is multidimensional. You've worked for many, many firms and have a lot of expertise in this space. Yeah, so um, at North is a pan-Nordic pan um, data center and HPC and, and AI provider. So we are, we are basing everything uh, based on our very sustainable data centers, placed where we can find uh, the, the highest degree of uh, renewable energy. And we built the whole stack. So we built it with, with all of us here together. And uh, we have uh, very large enterprises from all over the world bringing their workloads First, they bring them uh, from on-premise when their data centers are no longer up to date for running HPC or AI or, uh, or, uh, or uh, very accelerated computing. So they bring it over uh, to, to, to ours who are entirely built for uh, this purpose. Uh, or we have more and more customers who migrate away from the cloud, from the public cloud, because they have experience that it's actually very good for general purpose computing and occasional usage, but uh, for HPC, which tend to be used on a constant base and optimized in the 24 by seven, it becomes way too expensive. So they come to us for cost reason, for total cost of ownership reason, but most, uh, and, and actually foremost, for the sustainability reason. Oh, thank you for that, okay. So maybe Sherbond, you could answer this for me. So uh, my understanding is in the near term, we're going to get to about 125 kilowatts of power in a in a single HPC rack. And I was trying to figure out, okay, is that a lot? <laughs> it sounds like a lot, but so it's like for a single day's usage is probably, you know, in kilowatt hours, it's at least five to six times the average US household. They're probably more like 10X because most <laughs> of the time you're sleeping. So is this a concern? Well, let, 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 let's put it in a different format. I, I, I think that 125, kilowatts per rack is already possible today. Actually, 200 kilowatts is very likely to be possible in, in tomorrow, but high density power is, was always a concern. And, you know, beside of the uh, energy cost, then you have safety, then you have cooling ch uh, challenging, and th these are only contributed to this one. Nevertheless, the, the, um, there is a result of these days semiconductor development and like any vendor uh, research, we will need to cope with these challenges now and in, in the future. We do foresee uh, changes in the environment, including the rack design, including cooling methods, included, included power distribution. But, you know, the energy issue uh, and, and the computational efficiency um, is not power per box or per racks. We, I, I, I think we should go um, further into this one and understand exactly when, when we are discussing is the overall um, uh, power footprint that uh, a system like that, uh, an expert system like that is using. Yeah, I think we're, from, our, from our perspective here, we certainly see you know, the more dense you make the power, the, the more efficient the system is. So that 125 kilowatt rack is a very efficient rack, but it's a difficult physical challenge to uh, to power and cool that, to get as much power there as you need and to get as much cooling there as you need. And that's why we are constantly asked about uh, liquid cooling, immersion cooling, um, you know, does air still have a future? And what I see is that all of the above are still still very relevant, still, still definitely in, in play, and I, I don't, I never count out the uh, the engineers behind all of those technologies because <laughs> there are significant breakthroughs when it comes to those uh, to those cooling and, and power discussions, and also there's other regulatory um, discussions as well that that are had with the the areas that host these data centers. Yeah, so there's no silver bullet. It's uh, as you say, it's all of the above a combination. So. Uh, like, what is the scale of this sustainability issue? I mean, I, obviously the economics are important. People want to, you know, maintain or, you know, ideally they'd love to lower the power bill, but that's like not likely, but, but, but you want to at least maintain it as a percentage of your overall spend or maybe even compress it. But, 
But why should HPC be so worried about this, Matt? Maybe you've got some thoughts on that. So I think from, from our perspective, we, we need to make these tools, as, as great as these tools are, they're only as good as they are accessible. And so currently we can do a, an exaflop in, in 20 megawatts. So that's what the, uh, the exaflop system at Oak Ridge National Laboratories does. And so with regards to, to that, if you expand that, if you continue that trajectory, it quickly becomes unsustainable. You're, you're looking at half of a nuclear power plant in order to get to a Zeta scale system. And so going beyond this and continuing on that present course and speed is, is simply unsustainable, which is why, again, for us, what we really need to do is figure out how to redo these problems. You can argue we've spent the last 20 or 30 years moving all applications to one architecture and then riding that semiconductor curve down. Whereas in the future, we're going to have to reconsider the actual computer science, the actual problem set there, and uh, and take the you know take the part problem apart in a way that can actually um, that it can actually be accelerated meaningfully. So okay, thank you. So so Guy, uh, my understanding then is 125 kilowatts per rack is a good thing, but you got to cool it. Right? So. <laughs> So what is the sort of state of the art? How are people trying to reduce their power consumption, you know, using waste power? Uh, is that something that's common? How are organizations uh, uh, approaching this and what's the impact? Well, what we hear from our clients and especially from our enterprise clients, they want to see the total TCO and that's still quite predominant. And what is then the sustainability impact of all this? So does it make sense for their business? So that's why they look at the whole the, the whole combination. Uh, is it in the right location? So actually they don't need to cool so much. Secondly, the data center design, the cooling design, how's the power being distributed? It has already been set here, but the whole stack comes together, meaning uh, every element of the technology comes together. And that's then the whole equation that determines, yeah, are the, is this done at a good TCO, at the total cost of ownership that makes sense for the business? And yes, technology-wise, it's absolutely possible to run more than 125 a rack. Uh, but what we then see in, 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 in let's say, uh, European data centers all over the place is that they leave the rest of the data center empty to be able to just uh, con convey and cool that one rack. That doesn't make any sense, right? right. So we want to do this really with an optimized data center, fully occupied, balanced power, balanced uh, cooling, and manageability of all it, because then the, the technology equation also goes up. All the technology you need to add comes to the cost of your PoE. If you add redundancy, if you add complexity and so on, it really com it comes all with a cost and that needs to be paid at the end. So that's why it needs to make sense. That's what we hear from our clients. And we have clients who say, yes, we want to prove uh, the future. That is possible. We want to really make a stake in the ground to show it off. And that's a very good reason to go beyond. But if it's just to be economical and to be sustainable, we, we look for more like an average design that, that makes sense for that TCO, not just for the sake of the, the, the most dense and the most uh, uh, technology-wise. But so, that also makes sense for, for example, for supercomputing centers when you want to show that off. So I get that, I mean, you got to look at the whole picture, the whole house, if you will. But I still got to ask, Matt, you may or may not know. So I should have asked you before. What does quantum do? Does quantum, is it more power consumptive? Do, do we know yet? Uh, is it less power consumptive? Wouldn't know. <laughs> Wouldn't yeah. know the power. <laughs> so, all right, to be uh, continued think, there. Yeah, does anybody yeah, know? Well, I, I mean. Well, we, we are comparing different technologies and I don't think it's correct. What, what quantum it will be at the end of the day is a different accelerator or a different way to use acceleration in place, right? So. It's definitely not the GPU <laughs> right, right, for, for, right. for that reason, but okay. it, it will definitely um, help the industry to develop for it. At, at least, you know, um, put it like that, HPC um, drives innovation to progress the humankind. In industry like healthcare, manufacturing, life science, whatever, you know, and sustainability, including this one, it will be a very important one to, to take forward. Yeah, there's a yeah, lot more social needed. good. Go ahead, Matt. See. To some extent, the answer is going to come from HPC because a lot of the applications that we get asked to to, um, uh, to benchmark and to, to understand uh, how well they work on HPC systems are actually the quantum simulators. So those are the ones that are we're actually modeling and trying to figure out and understand 
and hopefully answer the question you asked with regards to uh, power efficiency, sustainability, and, and really overall usefulness uh, of the technology. Interesting, quantum and AI will solve for quantum and AI. Um, uh, Guy, I think it's probably appropriate for this question. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but most data centers today are probably powered by coal, is that correct? And uh, how, So how do you design a data center differently if the power is, is green? Is there is there a different way to think about it? Well, then location is the first uh, element to it. Eh? Can you get renewable energy to a hundred percent or to a, a very high degree? And in some areas it is, uh, or it's very fluctuating or it's just like a very low percentage. And that is, that's happened to be much easier for us. That's why we are focusing so much on, first of all, HPC and AI, but also on the location being in the Nordics, um, where, where are actually a lot of, uh, yeah, in all the countries we can get uh, uh, close to 100% or 100% uh, renewable energy. So location is the first, uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first part. And then the design of the data center entirely built for uh, HPC and AI and for high density workloads. That's the second one from a power point of view, especially from a cooling point of view. And uh, yeah, we, we use more and more heat recovery and uh, you know, reuse the, the, the wasted heat and uh, sell it again into the municipalities. And that's happened also to be well developed in the Nordic countries and not yet or not uh, in, 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 in many parts in the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, Shirban, is the quest for a PUE of one, is that still a holy grail milestone if all the power is renewable? Well, we, we heard Guy earlier saying that locality is one of the important things to consider. Uh, th there were time where we built data center because the land was cheap. Um, now we are looking to understand if the workloads we are running are running into the correct data center. And here with a lot of concerns related to security and things like that, PoE is a power usage efficiency, right? Is, is, is an indicator of how it, a system is running, right? But probably on a, on a short term, we should look as well on the, um, on the carbon footprint and not only from a price performance per watt, but also into what does it mean um, in terms of the carbon um, uh, which we are which we are releasing, so I I, I think into this one um, definitely we must drive for um, greater efficiency, um, and you know sustainability is part of how you are designing your solution. Um, in order to have a system able to perform on your needs. So I, I don't think that PUE alone is the only one. I think that the answer is that we will need to look constantly at new indicators related to how a system is used. Got it, makes sense. Uh, hey, Go ahead. Matt. I was just going to chime in about the efficiency part, right? In terms of if we have, um, if we don't strive for continued efficiency, continue lowering of the PO, PUE, we're wasting really, you know, even if it's all renewable, we're wasting the renewable energy that could go to other uses in society. And so I, I think it's it's extremely important to make sure uh, that we are as efficient as we can be, that we're good stewards of the resources that we have because, you know, renewable energy isn't as yet enough to power, you know, the entire world. So the more of it that we can, you know, use efficiently and the more that it can be shared across the other areas of the economy and of society, I think the better. Gotcha. Uh, Guy, is it better to move data centers to locations where energy is green, or maybe you can use, you know, outside air and where the temperatures are cold, you know, up in, up in Iceland or wherever. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, su the success we see now and the, the demand we see is that people are getting it. Eh? Of course, this is not new. We're doing it since 10, 15 years that we started to build out first in Iceland and attracted workloads from literally first all of Europe, but now a lot of US companies and and, and, and workloads being run out of Asia. So everything that is, I would say, everything that's not latency dependent and HPC usually is not, or machine learning is not, you can, you can run it wherever in the world. So you run it at the best place where actually the PUE is low, but then the other aspect of the PUE then is also that why not always you need full redundancy, you not always need tier three or, or, or very high tier data centers where there is a lot of redundancy, where everything is fully, fully redundant. 
So that's also part of energy being used for that redundancy and that efficiency. If not needed, why why over design it? So that is the other the other aspect. But location is is definitely the first one. There is so many data centers that are just used because people are used to have it nearby and want to see the lights fl flashing, but it's not it's not really needed. It's not uh, yeah. There is no technical or economical reason to to keep it running in very inefficient places. Right. So that's what we see now. We see yeah, really global companies moving at mass away from inefficient locations or from general public cloud, because they see also that general public cloud are, are run in Europe in the flag countries mainly, which are per definition made also for general compute and not optimized for HPC, so actually not fully uh, efficient. So that is the other equation that we that we see, that uh, that people are, are really moving very, very large uh, workloads. So we, we, we have now, well, for example, BMP Paribas has done that since five years, that they bring over their their heaviest calculations first in Iceland, then in Sweden, and um, and uh, yeah, literally all of it is now uh, uh, brought over, and they have just saved more than fifty percent of their carbon footprint. So uh, uh, yeah, that's that's the proof of it. Uh, very large corporations are doing it. So uh, which put, which puts which puts ahead. some sorry to, to cut you. Yeah, please. Which puts some. Um, some back uh, perspective what we start the conversation from it's the architecture is the design and not the last is the reliability of the system is exactly what Guy was mentioning earlier related to why you need to double and to make it super redundant when you can if the system is reliable you can use it uh, better in, in this perspective You're right Absolutely. And that saves a lot about economics and power. Matt, what, what are the big sources of sustainable energy that are being used to power HPC today and how will that change in the future? I, th I think it's really locational, right? In terms of if you're near a lot of water, you can use water. If you're in a sunny location, sort of in the, like the Middle East, for example, solar comes into play. Um, geothermal is certainly the, uh, the case in Iceland. And I, I think it really depends on the, uh, the environmental characteristics and, and how the, uh, you know, where the renewable energy, uh, where the renewable energy sources come from. I mean, once you, once you get the renewable energy and also figure out a way to store it, um, then you know, for that, from that perspective and that point on, it's it's basically just energy, and and so then it can go into the data center and power the workloads. But we need to have a broad portfolio of renewable energy sources because of the um, because they're all different in in terms of the different areas of the world have strengths in some and weaknesses in others. And so we need to be, uh, I think the answer really isn't as much of a direct answer as you were looking for, but the, the answer really is that it is situationally dependent on, on really what's available. Kind of another, it depends question. Uh, what's the right model for, from a sustainability standpoint, should I run my workloads in the cloud or should I run them on-prem? Oh, Guy, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, we just published the white paper, which is based on uh, a lot of customer uh, feedback. Uh, so yeah, please find it out on our website and uh, it's fresh. Uh, so in that is when you have occasional use, which sometimes is in HPT, very important. You have no idea you know, how much you need to use. You have no idea for how long. Well, that, then the cloud model is perfect to try it out. Once you have a lot of use, which a lot of HPC centers have, they have 24 by seven. It's 99. It's 100 percent used. That's not. The, that's absolutely not where the cloud is made from. So then you do it, or you do it on premise when you have it at the right location, at the right uh, full stack sustainability and efficiency. Um, but then the model is really the the most efficient model is that you have a baseline capacity for catering your day to day needs, so that you have the best return on investment for all your uh, engineers. Uh, time, but also on your, your software licenses. So you, you really have the most efficient system at the best DCO available for your baseline. And on top of that, you scale up and you scale down. But what we offer is that do that on the same on the same location. So your data gravity that you don't, yeah, because we talk here about machine learning, or we talk about big simulations where the data pack is also huge. So if you then need to send this from an on-prem to a public cloud, that cost of egress ingress is total waste. And that's also sustainability that is lost yeah. because it, you just send it for, for sending data back and forward. So actually what we do is a combination of both, of both worlds, the best of both worlds. 
is that we cater for a very solid baseline, very efficient, and there we grow the cluster and we shrink it back. So that is actually the best of both worlds without the data gravity in the middle. Yeah, you're seeing the whole cloud operating model move to on-prem. I mean, it's obvious that that's yeah. happening. This has been a great power panel, pun intended, but Gerbond, I'll give you the, the last word. Give us the, the summary and bring us home. Look, um, it's uh, it, first of all, it was a joy to, um, to have uh, my colleagues here um, uh, together with us. Um, I, I sincerely believe that uh, what we are putting on sustainability drives forward into on how every one of our customers is going to run the business. Back to the previous idea, you can build it on-prem, you can consume it as a service, either uh, on demand, um, HPC on demand uh, as a collocation or into a, as a service via, via Apex. And everything which we are trying to, to put together um, in front of our customers is to make their journey much more predictable, much more easy to be understood from, um, uh, from a results point of view. I think, um, I think that the future is really bright. And when I'm looking to what we can put together into, by the industry into this segment is incredibly promising. Excellent. Gentlemen, thanks so much. It was great to have you on the program to learn about this really important issue. All right, keep it right there for more coverage of ISC 2023 and theCUBE, your leader in enterprise tech coverage.